my name is uh, Vincent Piquet. Um, I'm the uh, EU's ambassador to Indonesia and to Brunei uh, Darussalam. And uh, this afternoon, I have the honor to be um, your um, moderator. Um, this is the month of, uh, of Ramadan. Um, so I wish all Muslim participants uh, Ramadan Karim. Um, uh, the European Union and Indonesia are very strong and long-standing partners. Um, <clears throat> we are like-minded in many areas. Um, we even, not, not many people know this, but uh, we even have, um, have exactly the same motto, uh, namely uh, United in Diversity, Bineka Tungal Ika. And uh, that's, uh, that makes us proud as partners. Um, in the Euro Indonesian coat of arms, uh, you will find a really cool eagle, the Garuda. Uh, uh, the EU does not have that. Um, instead, we have a, um, a flag uh, with uh, yellow stars on a blue background. You see it in uh, my screenshot. And and the funny thing is, and the interesting thing is, that as you will recall from your physics class, that uh, if you mix blue uh, with yellow, you get green. So um, uh, that is the theme of this meeting. It's the, uh, the green agenda uh, that we wish to expand um, with Indonesia in a bilateral uh, fashion. Um, the, we do the, hold a seminar uh, in the background of the COVID crisis, and uh, one may ask why talk about uh, the green agenda uh, while the COVID crisis is still uh, raging. But um, that is, of course, true. We have to get uh, COVID under control, uh, turning the corner gradually in Europe, and Indonesia is on its way. Um, but for that reason, certainly we have to think post-COVID. We have to think how we make our economies, our societies uh, rebound once we over, are over the crisis. And, and there, of, clearly, you come into the climate uh, topic. Uh, this weekend in The Economist, there was a very uh, good cartoon, I thought, uh, a cartoon that shows a boxing ring uh, within the ring, um, the, uh, round, round number one, within the ring, uh, the world against uh, COVID. Um, round number two is about to start, and you see the cartoon here, and you see there the even sphere, more fearful opponent waiting to enter the ring for round two, and that opponent is the, uh, the, co uh, uh, the climate crisis that is looming. Uh, over the earth. And it is for that reason that the European Union has uh, launched uh, its European Green Deal proposal. It's a proposal for a strategy uh, to make the European economy and indeed society truly green and truly circular and carbon neutral. And all that uh, by the target year of 2050. Um, to talk about that, we have today some, some eminent speakers from Brussels, from the European Commission and from uh, Indonesia for, a question, uh, for, for questions uh, like what's in the EU Green Deal, Green Deal? how will it work, uh, what's in it for business, what role can it play and how can the EU and Indonesia uh, partner. Um, we have three speakers to kick off the webinar. I will introduce you them as, as we go along. Um, after the three interventions, we will have an, an open debate. And uh, for you can everybody's welcome to raise questions. Please use the, the chat box for that. And um, after the question and debating session, uh, we will conclude by uh, 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 remarks uh, from Corinne Tapp, uh, the president of Eurocham, with whom 
we are happy uh, to partner for this webinar. Now, Diederik Samson brings, I think, a very broad and very profound experience to this in, uh, discussion. He has uh, strong roots as an environmentalist. He's a former member of the European, sorry, of the Dutch uh, uh, National <laughs> Parliament. Uh, he was CEO of a green energy company and he was director uh, in, of Greenpeace uh, the Netherlands. And right now uh, in his uh, function as head of the private office of the executive vice president, he plays a leading role in the shaping and the rollout of the European Green Deal. Uh, I give the floor to, uh, to Diederik Samson. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Thank you. Um, I missed a minute of your introduction, but the rest of this was flattering enough. So uh, uh, let's kick off. And, and indeed, I would like to use my uh, short introduction to uh, give you a short overview of the Green Deal as we presented it in December, which now seems ages ago. Um, also, uh, I would like to, to tell you a bit more on how the Green Deal is now changing in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. And obviously, I'm going to address the um, implications of, of the Green Deal and uh, COVID-19 uh, towards our external pol policies, including, obviously, the country you are most interested in, which is Indonesia. Um, first of all, the Green Deal itself. We presented it in, in December. and um, I can say, I think objectively, that it got a, uh, a good response. And I think that's because of the fact that it stood out from normal environmental policies uh, that we are used to in the European Commission. We produced dozens of them in the last decade. But the Green Deal is different in a few ways. First of all, obviously, it's different in terms of its ambition. For once, politicians didn't go for the feasible, but for the necessary. So uh, we set our ambitions towards what is actually needed to preserve the environment for the future, to preserve uh, planet Earth for our kids. Um, uh, so we went for the climate neutrality in 2050, including a target of minus 55 uh, in 2030, which are ambitious, which are in line uh, with the Paris Agreement, and which would actually be the first time that we are really in line with uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, but also on other subjects, um, we, we set ambitious targets to stop uh, the, the loss of biodiversity completely, to stop the pollution, so a zero pollution ambition, um, sustainable agriculture. So we set a, a range of targets with all a pretty high ambition. And the range also um, explains the second way it stands out from normal environmental policies. This was not only about one thing. This was not only about energy. This is not only about uh, transport. This is not only about climate. This is about our ecosystem, uh, about everything. And there's a good reason for that. There is only one ecosystem. Uh, it's connected. We live in it. Uh, and by the way, we live from it. Uh, and we should preserve it for ourselves and future generations. Um, the third way the, the Green Deal stood out from normal environmental policies is what we call justness, fairness. Uh, it's actually a social policy. Um, we, we learned the lessons of transitions of the past. Uh, transitions towards a new economic system always have a, what you could call a Darwinistic nature. Uh, they most of the time end up with more money and more power in the hands of fewer people. Um, Actually, well, you, you can go a one, and a, a one and a half age back and, and look at the steam engine and the invention of it. It led to huge wealth, but also to huge inequality. And it led to the rise of social movements and the social democratic uh, politics. Uh, and now for we didn't want to repair the damage afterwards. We want to put justness front and center into the Green Deal. Um, with a motto that this Green Deal will be a just one or it will not happen. Um, and the fourth item which make, made it stand out from normal environmental policies is important in the context of COVID-19. When we presented it in, in, in December 2019, we got some criticism, especially from environmental NGOs, for presenting it as a growth threat, 
as a new impulse to the European economy. We are a continent uh, which is aging, which is having an, uh, an, a very thorough, but also pretty old and conservative industry, and we need new impulses. We needed a new model on which we could base economic growth, new jobs, sustainability for, uh, for next generations. So we presented it as a new growth strategy, and even the word Marshall Plan was mentioned uh, in December as an investment strategy to get the, the European economy on a new level. Well, uh, that's December 2019. And uh, the beginning of March, a little earlier already for some, but at the beginning of March, uh, COVID-19 entered our continent and changed the world completely. Uh, we are now in a completely different economic situation. Uh, we are in a completely different health situation and we need to recover from this. We need a recovery strategy. We need um, money, but also a plan uh, to recover the European e economy from this unprecedented crash that we are actually still in the midst of. Um, we need a Marshall Plan. So uh, it's not very, um, it, it's, it's reasonable and actually quite logic that we uh, took the Marshall Plan that we just presented, uh, the Green Deal. And at the moment, we are designing a recovery strategy based on that green transition, because we know that we need to invest in our economy to get it back on its feet. Uh, we know that we have limited amounts of money available, so we can better invest it right in the first instance uh, and not recover our economy and then afterwards uh, make the transition towards a green, uh, green society. So the, the best way that we can go forward is take the Green Deal and use it as our recovery instrument. Not just like that. Uh, the world changed. Uh, there's an, an, well, a completely different context. We need to take that into account. So what we're now doing is basically putting the investment parts of the Green Deal that deliver jobs and growth at the fastest pace, we put them in front. Uh, to give you one example, the renovation wave, which was part of the Green Deal, which was, is the plan to insulate our homes and to make them sustainable, uh, install solar panels on there, um, install electrical charging points for our, our future cars, renovate our homes uh, for the future, 200, mil 200 million houses in Europe. Um, we put that now uh, front and center of the Green Deal because, well, those investments deliver jobs, especially to small and medium enterprises. Uh, they deliver new growth. And obviously, they also deliver a lower energy bill to the people living in those houses, which is, um, well, uh, which, is a, which comes in, in handy at the moment with uh, lowering power purchasing uh, for, for households. We also have other strategies that we will now give more emphasis to. Uh, renewing our energy system includes investing in hydrogen, in biogas, uh, so in the, the new transport, the new gases of the future, uh, getting rid of methane and obviously of coal and oil uh, at a faster pace. And, and those new big investments deliver also the new growth that we need at a faster pace than we actually originally thought. So counterintuitively, what you always think is that once you get into such a crisis, all green ambitions go overboard into the dustbin uh, and, and we concentrate on, on keeping what we have, we try to do the opposite. We try to use this crisis, so to speak, to make a new start into the future. Um, what does that mean for our external policies? Um, well, as you might have read already in the, in the original Green Deal from December, Europe took a, can I call it more assertive, more vigilant position towards the rest of the world if, we, if you talk about environmental standards. We were um, planning and, and we commit ourselves to raising the level playing field, not only our, our own level playing field, but also the one of our trading partners, uh, which was not only, always very popular outside of Europe, obviously, because it means, means a new conversation with our trading partners about the standards that we need to meet. But it also means a new relationship with our trading partners in terms of investment, technical assistance, new possibilities that can be explored. And that's actually what I would like to talk about in this, in this seminar, uh, because we have new options to explore. As I said, one of the big issues that we are facing right now in, in Europe is changing our, uh, our methane, 
our natural methane and fossil methane towards new types of gas. And obviously hydrogen, but also biogas is an option for that. And it, it enables us, actually it requires us to uh, take one step beyond the traditional fossil, uh, biofuels towards third and even fourth generation biofuels. And if there's one country that can be a partner in that, it's obviously Indonesia. Um, but that also requires us to move beyond, let's say, the traditional palm oil discussion into a new era, an era of real sustainable biomass uh, and biogas and some other biofuels with also more added value on the Indonesian side of things uh, because um, not only transporting the raw material into Europe and then transferring it to, into all kinds of gases and fuels, but making that transition already in Indonesia itself. So raw materials, yes, but including the technology to transfer that into use. That's only one example of the many examples that we can talk about, and I'm looking forward uh, to do that in the next hour. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks uh, very much indeed, uh, Diederik, uh, for that uh, that kickoff of the debate and and for um, pitching uh, the uh, the very innovative uh, uh, character of uh, the European Green Deal policy uh, so well um, uh, for placing it in into the context of COVID and how it, uh, the Green Deal can respond uh, to. Um, uh, to um, the uh, the crisis that we are trying to emerge from, uh, and lastly, also for your your comment on the how to, how we could uh, partner as European Union with um, with a country like in Indonesia, um, a country which um, is one of the most biodiversity rich uh, places um, on earth. So thanks thanks for that. Um, I suggest we, we move on to our second um, panelist and um, I'll introduce him to you. It's uh, Mr. Carianto uh, Vibovo. Um, he uh, he uh, has a dec uh, an experience of, uh, of several decades um, in um, professionally uh, in sustainability on risk management and on sourcing and supply project man management with a variety of, uh, of large firms, uh, including uh, Philip Morris, uh, uh, Sampurna, uh, Aqua Danone, that's the first European firm he works uh, for, and, and now for Danone Indonesia. Uh, in Danone Indonesia, he is Director of Sustainable Development and at the same time, he plays a role in the European Chamber of Commerce, Eurocham, where he's the deputy head of the Sustainable Development uh, Working Group. And uh, in that capacity, has, he has uh, contributed to a number of projects uh, by the uh, Eurocham on sustainable development. Um, Karianta, please take the floor. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador Vincent. So I'm going to share the screen. I will have uh, presentations. Uh, can you enable the share screen, please? I cannot share it. Okay. All right, so uh, quickly, uh, basically, what I'm going to share is more on how Eurogem uh, work hand on hand to build the future, uh, future sustainable business uh, in Indonesia. So I give uh, two perspectives, which is the first one is from the European, uh, from Euro, Eurogem perspective. And then the second one is basically just to give you an idea how uh, Danone is actually uh, doing uh, in Indonesia, what Danone is doing in Indonesia linked to the topics that we just discussed more towards how we address the climate change issue and so forth. So quick one on Eurocham, I guess uh, most of you understand uh, what is Eurocham. It is established in 2004 and then basically uh, it is a, a kind of a platform policy advocacy uh, for European business and chambers uh, for quality action enhancing the competitive and easiness of business 
climate uh, in Indonesia. So basically in the Eurocham, definitely now with the leadership of Corin, definitely uh, sustainability is really the topic that we really want to push further because this will really give opportunity for us as the European uh, business to contribute uh, toward uh, Indonesia in terms of achieving the sustainable development goal. And as well as uh, how we uh, anticipate on the European Green Deal as uh, what we discussed uh, before. And then uh, basically uh, what we have, been, we have been done so far uh, in terms of the sustainability, I think uh, we have uh, hundreds of members, which is uh, all of them actually is doing uh, respective uh, initiative on sustainability. But uh, last year we launched a report on SDG report uh, comprising of uh, several members of Eurocham uh, to, to really uh, show and also uh, expose on how Eurocham companies contribute to the SDG achievement of Indonesia. And at the same time also, as a Eurocham, we are, we are uh, keep promoting on more sustainable business model, for example, like the circular, circular economy, as well as how we, we, we push the business to be forced, uh, forced for good towards more inclusive uh, business model in the future. So basically, uh, I think uh, towards uh, Green Deal, I believe that European business in Indonesia, uh, now we are doing best example on a sustainable initiative. There are many companies already uh, focusing more to the renewable energy, circular economy business model, the water preservation, biodiversity, responsible consumption, as that and so forth. So uh, this is something that uh, I think we can further discuss on what kind of initiative that potentially we can do together aligned with the Green Deal. And then now I go specific on the non to just to give you an idea how we as a business to really uh, focusing on addressing uh, not just the business but more towards a sustainable uh, business model uh, uh, you know uh, this is the way to be a uh, climate neutral in the in the future so because basically this is uh, done on we have the vision on one planet one health where we believe that the health of the people and the health of the planet are interconnected therefore we commit to preserve the health of the planet uh, to nurture the adoption of healthier eating habit uh, and also the drinking habit in in Indonesia. This is a quick one uh, who we are. Basically, uh, we are mainly uh, entering Indonesia through the MNA uh, with the Aqua as a pioneer on the hydration, Sariusada uh, for the early life nutrition, nutritia, and also uh, nutritia medical uh, nutrition. And then basically, this is uh, how how we uh, this is our product basically which is we are pushing more to the naturality of the product uh, through aqua and then we also have the product which is really healthy product with a science base uh, clinically proven uh, locally and then also we we are uh, committed to be a responsible business uh, being certified as a big corporations uh, in indonesia and as well as uh, globally we aim to be being certified by 2030 this is our economical impact to Indonesia. Uh, we have a product which is all a healthy category product with 25 plants, uh, 1.5 million outlets. We are with uh, more than 2 million people working together with us directly and indirectly with 15,000 of employees all over Indonesia. This is how, how significant is our impact for the economy in Indonesia. And then our commitment for the healthy planet basically focusing on the four elements. The first one on the climate, which is we committed to be a zero uh, carbon neutral by 2050 on the what and the second one is on the water, how to protect and conserve water. The third one is on the circular economy, especially on the packaging and the last one is on the agriculture part. I go quickly, I will start with the circularity of packaging because this is the topic where we are always every day we talk about the topic. Uh, on the packaging circularity, we have the ambition to 2025 to be majority reuse model, which is currently we are 70% on reu reusable model to our jugs business, 100% recyclability, and then we will half the use of virgin PET by 2025, as well as commitment to collect more than we produce uh, so that no bottles will end up in the, in the nature. This is kind of a model how we measure our progress. You see basically this is just an, an assumption where we grow as we grow. There will be a lot of, uh, I mean, there will be additional plastic that we have to use, but, the, but because we use uh, more circular business model, use more recycled materials, then 
we decline or we reduce the use of virgin uh, materials or virgin plastic so that it will not uh, bring more impact to the uh, climate at the same time also we contribute also we support government to uh, do the in interceptor inter interception i would say uh, to eliminate or to reduce uh, plastic entering to the environment through the different type of initiative at the same time also we educate consumer because this is the very important to to educate consumer for the uh, behavior change because this is something which is really relevant here in indonesia and this and the second part on the circular water uh, we we focus on you know uh, implementing the water stewardship especially in the scarcity area this is just to give you an idea this is our plan and how we do the initiative to protect the water in the area where the water infiltrates to the aquifer, working with the community and also providing them access for the clean water. And then the third one and the carbon, uh, which is we have the ambition to be fully carbon neutral by 2050 and then 100% renewable energy by 2030. So, of course, uh, this is on top of what we do to optimize the energy use in our factory. We also access for the renewable energy. An example here is to put a solar panel for our factory, and then we plan to, to have it all of our 22 factory across Indonesia. So that this is something that we can do to reduce the impact of the carbon emissions. So this is basically in summary, we know that we still have a lot of challenges. I mean, Danone as well as the Eurogem, we are part of the ecosystem. There are a lot more that we can do to be part of the solution to help Indonesia government to fight against climate change and then also some other sustainability uh, issue. So uh, in, in summary, uh, I mean Danone, especially as a goodness company, we want to really inspire and support the Indonesia progress for better uh, health of Indonesian and also for the planet. So this is just to have uh, illustration on Eurogem and also Danone, then I'm happy to further discuss with you. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks uh, very much. Uh for your um, for your um, presentation, um, I think with a good mix um, between what you do at the uh, at the factory level um, uh, in in, in, in Indonesia, uh, with uh, a couple of pointers to uh, what Eurocham is doing generally, and um, I think it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good story you have to to, to bring there about uh, the principles of sustainability and um, reducing energy and uh, resource intensiveness intensity sorry um, in, in in the firm so very very interesting thank you for that and um, which uh, now brings uh, me to the introduction of our third speaker in the panel before we uh, we later on open the open the floor, and I do encourage uh, the participants to send their questions via the chat box uh, to us, uh, so that we can um, uh, raise them with the panelists. Um, <clears throat> the third speaker, uh, very uh, glad to welcome uh, uh, Ms. Shinta Kamdani. Now, in Indonesia, I think. Um, Everybody will know that Ms. Shinta is a very uh, influential woman entrepreneur. Um, uh, not maybe one of the most influential, uh, not only in this country but also in, in Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, she is the uh, CEO of a large uh, industrial uh, conglomerate, the Sintesa uh, Group, and um, um, which has a strong presence in Indonesia and beyond. She is the Vice Chair of the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Kadin, and uh, she's also in the, in the Chamber, the Vice Chair of the, um, of the Chamber's Environment, Climate Change and Sustainability, uh, Sustainable Development Committee. And um, moreover, she is an Executive Board Member of the WWF, Indonesia, so plenty of uh, green credentials there. So I would be very happy uh, indeed, uh, Shinta, if you could take the floor with your presentation, please. Let me put on my slides. Um, thank you for this opportunity. So refreshing to talk. Uh, 
um, outside of COVID. It's been like COVID, COVID every day, speaking about COVID and <laughs> Indonesian efforts. So it's nice to talk about uh, a different topic today. I think um, it's important, green economy is important, and Indonesia, um, this is not actually a new concept because in 2012, Bapenas has created the guidelines of um, green economy uh, as part of, at that time, Indonesian M MDG. And now, today, uh, the green economy agenda is, has been adjusted to uh, and carried out into today's, uh, what we call, sustainable development goals and recent economic development agendas. Um, so it's there, the government is there, it's in line. Uh, of course, we all know our biggest issue has always been the uh, implementation. But uh, I just want to, so the uh, Indonesia target actually is quite, um, we, we are supposed to reduce greenhouse uh, gas 29% uh, on our own in 2030 and 41% uh, with, with support. Today, uh, we have reached, I think, about 20 um, 4.5%, so we still have quite a, a bit to go. And um, as far as the Kadin is concerned, um, the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we are the umbrella of all businesses in Indonesia, mandated by law. Uh, we, are, we have offices in all 34 provinces, and uh, we have actually set up uh, what we call the IBCSD, Indonesian Business Coalition on Sustainable Development, in which we bring companies, uh, champion companies, um, who are really prioritizing sustainable development um, in their agenda. So um, that's um, involvement of, of Kadin, and we have been uh, very much uh, working uh, in line with the government in uh, achieving um, uh, government uh, programs as well. I wanted to, to, to start by uh, looking at some of the challenges that we are facing, uh, talk about the implementation. I think there are three aspects. Um, on the policy level, um, I can see that many of the regulatory framework, you know, uh, are not, uh, what the government is doing are not in line. I can just give very uh, quick example on renewable energy, for example. Um, Indonesia has a very poor transition energy uh, policy. Um, we have a target. Yes, the target is there, which is 23% 20 uh, renewable by 2025. Unfortunately, we are now uh, still sitting less than 11%, very far away. Um, and the way if we are not changing our policy, what will happen is it will actually going, go down. It will not go up. And um, we have until today still subsidized fossil fuels, so it's very hard to compete when we talk about um, um, costs. Uh, we also don't have strict policy on recycling, uh, on waste management in general. So a lot of our technical policy need to be adjusted to give more um, tangible leverage and uh, ease um, to green businesses or uh, even circular economy model. Now, on the market side, if you can look at the market side, it's obvious that we have significantly low awareness of uh, environmental responsibility. I think our household, we can see our, the, in, within the community, um, is still hardly recycle our waste and some even just, you know, throw away <laughs> burn their waste regularly. Um, so this is not supportive to a circular economic model, uh, even though they are recycling uh, businesses in Indonesia. So while the industry, the businesses are, are slowly, uh, you know, like what Danone is doing, trying to focus on this. But I think we still have a very, uh, very um, uh, weak market. Um, and this is, this is one of the biggest challenge that uh, we face in, uh, in Indonesia. So um, on sustainable products, we talk about green products. I think uh, consumers are still uh, picking uh, Lower uh, a lower price rather than going into those. Although I, I have to say that we have moved, so in other words, we are progressing, but obviously not to the level that we are we, we want. On the capital side, I think uh, business uh, tend not to have uh, enough capital to purchase, to innovate, to adopt, and run green technology. So um, this is a, a big issue, and I think uh, all this. This adoption requires significant amount of capital that we may not 
uh, have. And I think uh, when we talk about change in business practices and skilled worker to run the technology, uh, this is also something that uh, we are still uh, lacking. But um, uh, we have worked um, also uh, with our uh, bank, uh, uh, with Bank Indonesia, with our banks, um, to provide more incentives uh, for green businesses, um, green investment. Um, you know, this is something that is still a work in progress, and I think uh, we still have a, quite a long way to go. Although globally, there have been um, uh, global banks that are following um, this. Now, I wanted to share with you uh, Indonesian green economy agenda. Um, Actually, the focus um, has been more on renewable energy, green, green infrastructure, and sustainable landscape management. And uh, these are some of the areas in Indonesia that I can highlight. Um, uh, we, are, uh, we have, for example, solar power plants, sustainable waste management project in, Suma, uh, in North Sumatra. We have special economic zone in Semanke. Uh, also some in the eastern side, Mandalika, Sumba, and NTT. Uh, but what I want to highlight is those in the East and Central Kalimantan, and this is which most of our green investments are located. All this in centralized, also on two industry that have been uh, that have also some trade issues with the EU, EU namely palm oil and um, wood based industry. In here, we have at least three active renewable energy projects which is utilizing palm palm oil waste and two palm oil uh, emission con control project, which correspond to the EU uh, red policy. And we also have two peatland restoration and management project, uh, public private reforestation uh, and land repurposing uh, uh, project and sustainability certified supply chain of wood and palm oil, which is targetly mainly to the uh, farmers and plasma farmers and small businesses in the two industry. So um, I have no doubt that the investment, I think uh, in respect to the market demand for CEO, uh, for the CPO and wood sustainability. But I think this is where we can really cooperate. I think it was mentioned at the beginning uh, that you know, um, we do need support in terms of uh, fulfilling the standard, EU standard, you know, how we can, get more capacity building in this area. And I think uh, we can also use uh, uh, many of the opportunity now that we have the, the, um, the ESC PA driving, ESC PA agreement, the Indonesia EU SIPA agreement to uh, drive more on the um, uh, capacity building aspect and uh, cooperation. So I think this is, this is an area that definitely we can look at um, on, uh, opportunities of cooperation. Other areas um, I want to mention is uh, paper industry. It has started uh, to produce more papers out of recycled paper waste and in the past few years most of the important papers are coming from developed countries such as US and EU and um, this is also uh, an opportunity to, co uh, to collaborate um, the policy, unfortunately, have um, in Indonesia have not yet adapted a balanced um, interest of creating supply stability and uh, the interest to uh, protect environment. So this is the policy side. We have to work more with the uh, with industry, with the environmental uh, ministry, to determine residue uh, tolerance of imported waste paper. So this is something that we still need to work on, but definitely the opportunity is there. On the automotive sector, as you know, um, we just signed the ESIPA and we've been promoting very much on um, um, electric, electric cars. And this is uh, still a long way to go, but I have to say that we, ha we are starting this production in Indonesia and I very much look forward for this to also be pushed more. Plastic and packaging are also uh, looking to transition to circular economy and um, um, also in tourism, if we look at Indonesia is creating 10 more Bali's. Uh, we are developing now also some ecotourism projects, you know, our group is actually doing one in North Sulawesi, special economic zone on tourism. 
So we are uh, moving into that direction. And if we talk about COVID-19, of, of course, right now, tourism industry is uh, <laughs> completely shut down. But this is, an, uh, this is an opportunity, I think, when we talk about post-COVID, when we talk about business uh, transformation um, uh, model, that some of these um, opportunities of going into more green businesses while we are transforming our business uh, post-COVID is something that we need to look at. Uh, next is the solid waste management and metal industry are still targeted largely underdeveloped uh, since most production of these metal uh, products in Indonesia utilize new ores and raw material instead of recycled material. And I think given the amount of Indonesia solid waste left uh, purely managed, the, the opportunity is um, definitely there. Um, um, I wanted to lastly mention about uh, the green lifestyle project that we are doing in IBCSD. Um, I think uh, Kadin really believe in importance of collaborating with local business partners, especially those who are uh, already sold and to some extent implement and promote the green economy. So um, uh, as part of this effort, we, ha we are doing a green lifestyle um, uh, project in which to support SDG number 12 of uh, responsible consumption and production. And um, we have uh, one of the major lessons from the program is that more from the business perspective, green lifestyle and sustainable consumption and production can be achieved if we address this more from both from uh, producers and consumers. So it's not just the companies, uh, but also from the market. So we are also educating uh, more the consumer, the market, uh, so that we can uh, do this um, successfully. So we are uh, going into phase two, step, step, uh, stepping up collaborative action with some of the companies mentioned. And I just wanna bring this as one of the example, many, many of course other things that we can, uh, we can do. Um, I do believe, again, that I want to mention and reiterate that the Indonesia EU SIPA will be a very good way uh, for us to look into some of these um, um, opportunities, how we can collaborate. And um, I think uh, I really look forward um, to have more concrete and um, actionable projects that we can work together. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much indeed, uh, uh, Ibu Shinta, for your, your uh, remarks. Uh, 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 and particularly, I mean, I was quite, quite surprised to see so how many projects uh, Kadeen itself is, uh, is undertaking um, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the level of the economy uh, to push uh, the green agenda. So quite, quite uh, uh, motivating, I think, and it opens certainly the uh, uh, the door for, for more cooperation.